Hello, I'm Wesley Simons. Welcome to WNBS Live. We'll be here each Wednesday night, Lord willing, from 7 to 7.30. We want you to study the Bible with us. We'll be studying great, important topics. Our speaker tonight is Eddie Kraft. Eddie is co-director of the Tri-City School of Preaching and Christian Development. He will do a beautiful job leading our study tonight so here's Eddie. Welcome to our Bible class. We appreciate you joining us tonight. We're going to continue our study of Cornelius. We began looking at that last week, and we're going to do a second part to that uh, this week. But we appreciate all of you all being in our class. We appreciate the folks joining us by Internet. And we hope that you'll be studying with us for the next little while as we look at some very, very important things relative to Cornelius. We appreciate so much those of you that have shown the interest in this and as Wesley pointed out in our first uh, class, this class is not designed to encourage folks to stay home and miss their regular worship assemblies, but it is designed for those that may not have the opportunity to attend. A lot of the older folks that don't get out at night, it gives you a chance to study with us from the inspired and perfect will of God. We've even had churches that are smaller that are using this as their Wednesday night Bible class. And for that, we are grateful. If we can be of assistance or help in those areas, we certainly appreciate that opportunity to do that. And we thank you for joining us. We're looking at some things that we learn from Cornelius. We learn, number one, that there is one way for all men. Now, class, this is quite contrary to what the religious world says. The religious world says there are many ways that we can travel as long as we're honest and sincere. But Tim, you might start us out with a few scriptures here that will help us to see that when it comes to salvation, there is really just one way for all men. That's exactly right, Eddie. The first scripture I'm going to use is taken from Romans uh, chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. It says, Therefore I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. That is written, the just shall live by faith. I want you to notice here, from these verses here, it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Not gospels of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. So there is only one gospel according to Romans chapter 1. Verses 16 and 17. Also from Acts chapter 15, verses 10 and 11. It says, Now therefore what tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ we shall be saved even as they. So that right there showed that the Jews and Gentiles are going to be saved the same way. The gospel... Uh, as recorded in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19, was to go to all nations, Mark 16 and verse 15, to every creature. So we can see there, Eddie, that there's one gospel and it must be obeyed by all in that's, order to be saved. That's right, that's good. Tim, how in the world can that be true when I've had people ask me, are you Jewish, Catholic, or Protestant? Now, Everybody, to a large degree, thinks you fall into one of those three categories. Now, biblically, are you saying that's not true? Well, when you take a look at the Bible, the Bible teaches that you, when you obey the gospel, you're a Christian. Uh, over in Acts 11 and verse 26, they were called Christians first at Antioch. As a matter of fact, uh, our Lord uh, said this over in John chapter 10 and verse Verses 14 through 16, he says, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep, and am known of mine, as the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Now watch this in verse 16. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. So okay. one fold and one shepherd. And when, when you obey the gospel, you're just a New Testament Christian. And you know, like Wesley said, sometimes on the Rise to Truth and other programs we've been on, they'll try to paint you in a corner, make you either Catholic or Protestant or premillennial or postmillennial or amillennial. And we just want to be what the Bible 
teaches us uh, to be. Acts 10, 34 and 35, I think are a couple of passages, fellas, in, in class that will help us too in looking at this question, is there just one way for all men? It says that Peter opened his mouth and said of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation, notice that, not in some, not in most, not in might, but in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted of him. And so here are some examples. Wesley, on our first program, you pointed out that you know, if you have a command, but you have examples to back that up, then you really have a tremendous amount of information that will help us on that. Uh, we have one of our first-year students, actually he's a second-year student from well, with us. Caleb, I'd like to just let you mention in a few minutes those examples that we just saw on the screen of conversions from Acts 8, which we've done looked at the Ethiopian unit, but we're glad to have Caleb with us and uh, a part of our Tri-City School of Preaching, Christian Development. And So Caleb, if you would, in looking at this point, there's one way for all men. Is it that the case when we look at Acts 9, Acts 10, Acts 16, so forth? When you look at Acts 8 and you see that the eunuch is traveling, one thing certainly that sticks out is there's a teacher involved. Philip comes to teach the eunuch, and when he's reading to him the gospel and they're riding in the chariot, you see that his interest is to obey the gospel, and he's saying, what must I do to be saved? Well, then you see that he's baptized. When Philip and the eunuch went down in the water, that was so that he could obey the gospel in Acts 8:36. And as they went on their way, they came into a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he was baptized. And just as you, know, you had mentioned, Wesley said, when you have example and command, you have a whole lot of information. Just in this one account, we have a whole lot of information that his salvation doesn't stop at belief like some denominations may teach, but there was also his belief that Jesus is the Son of God, and he confessed that before Philip. He confessed it before God, and then he obeyed the gospel, being baptized, fully immersed in water. You see that in Acts 8 and also in Acts 9, and then going into Acts 10 again with the, the Roman citizen and the Roman soldier. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, here we're looking at our examples of what we must follow, and then Acts 16 with the Philippian jailer. There, one thing that we'll see also in that account, again, the examples that we have, one example that we can get from Acts 16 that really sticks out in my mind is the urgency. And also the repentance of the jailer after Paul and Silas being beaten and imprisoned. You see that they are uh, released from the prison. Verse 29, it says, They sprang in, or he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? There again is the interest. You know, no one is going to obey the gospel who's not really interested. Right. You know, people that may say, you know, God took me over in my, in my bedroom. Well, you don't read of that in the Bible. You don't read of God taking over a soul. But then here, again, the question is asked, just as the, uh, the eunuch had, had asked the question. And they said, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And he said, Believe on the Lord thy, uh, Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And they spake unto him the words of the Lord. And I believe Brother Tim had just said a moment ago uh, about Cornelius speaking words to them, or right. Peter speaking words to Cornelius. Here, if someone may have tried to say that, well, here, when they answered how to be saved, they said, answered him, Believe. Well, he didn't even know yet what to believe because they hadn't taught him yet. That's right. So then they teach him the, the gospel, in verse 33, and he took the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and his straight way. See the urgency there. That's right. That's, that's excellent. So, Wesley, then, when you're looking at these cases of conversion, they all did the same thing, didn't they? Right. Wouldn't it be ridiculous, Eddie, to say, you know, the eunuch, he, he experienced faith only. The uh, Roman citizen Saul, here is a man who prayed the sinner's prayer. Of course, Cornelius was elected from the foundation of the world. He had no choice. And the jailer, here's an individual who had an experience. The Holy Spirit worked upon him directly. And boy, he knew he was saved as a result thereof. Now, wouldn't that be ridiculous? Right. And that's what the religious world wants us to believe, that this is what happens. Then they'll let the eunuch be a Baptist. Then they'll uh, let Saul be a Methodist. They'll let Cornelius be a Presbyterian. They'll let the jailer be a Mormon. 
Well, I don't know about a Mormon. Because, you know, a lot of people, the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses, no, sir. No, we don't, we don't buy into those religions. Well, we got a question if that's true. You know, people who call a rise to truth. We don't go along with the Jehovah's Witnesses. Well, sir, would you mind telling me why? Well, what they teach is out of harmony with the Bible. Well, now, wait a minute. If we're going to judge the Jehovah's Witnesses by the Bible, we've got to judge every religious group by the Bible, including the Church of Christ. That's right. And you know, Wesley, uh, in this last election, I had religious people tell me, I won't vote for Romney because he's a Mormon. Mm -hmm. Now these same people believe that there's saved people in all churches. Yeah. And so then, why not? Yeah, that's you know, exactly if, right. If there's saved people in all churches, yeah. or you could have even said Cornelius being a good man, he didn't have to be in any church. That's right. And they'd have accepted him. But like you said, they, the Bible teaches we've all got to follow it. And that's right. true for the Church of Christ as well. Oh yeah. We've got to follow the Bible because we're no better than anyone else. Eddie, we want the listening audience to know we want them to investigate us. That's right. We do not want them to take our word on any subject. As we always say on Arise to Truth, check us out. Your soul's too precious, eternity's too long, and hell's too hot for you to take the word of some individual and wind up lost. And we don't want to do that. Right. We want to do what the Bible says. I watched Oral Roberts, two or three other preachers on television, and they were trying to talk about the Jews. And they wanted to make the Jews saved, get them saved, regardless of their buying into Jesus Christ. So all Robert said, really, folks, there's two ways of being saved. You can be a Christian or you can be a Jew. And one of the guys said, well, I don't know if we want to word it exactly that way. There's two ways of being saved. Because it kind of seems like the Bible says there's one. But I agree with you, Mr. Roberts, that the Jews are going to be saved. And uh, we uh, uh, Gentiles have got to believe in Jesus Christ. No, Jesus said, except you believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. That's right. I think Howard has a, a question or comment too, Wesley. You know, uh, Dad, in Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, Jesus told his disciples to go therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. The plan of salvation has been the same since Pentecost, and it will be the same to the end of the world. Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be damned. And people are always wanting to change it. Mm -hmm. What we need to do is accept what God says. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by God's word. That's right, Howard, and... Uh it's sad that, like you said, it'll read at the day of judgment the same way it reads tonight. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And we can't change that because somebody may not like it or they're not going to obey it. We've still got to follow what the Word of God says. Tim and I were sitting here a little bit before uh, we came on the air, and Tim was just going through verse after verse that emphasized, like in Acts 15, and you may have others, Tim. I'm not trying to pull you to Acts 15 necessarily. But you were going that verse after verse. It was amazing. How many verses talked about they were preaching? He saved them by grace. He saved them just like he did the other people. Showing there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. That's exactly right, Eddie. Matter of fact, uh, in Acts 10 and verse 6, here he lodgeth with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. He's going to tell mm -hmm. what Cornelius and his household ought or must do in order to be saved. Then in verse 22, and they said, Cornelius, the centurion, a just man, and one that feareth God, and of good report among all nations of the Jews, was warned from God by an holy angel to send for thee into his house, now watch this, and to hear words of thee. So he was to hear words. Mm -hmm. Then over in verse 32 of Acts 10, Send therefore to Joppa, and call hither Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodged in the house of one Simon a tanner by the seaside, who, when he cometh, shall speak unto thee. Well, what was he going to do? He's going to speak words unto him. Right. Then in verse 33, Immediately therefore I sent to thee, and thou hast well done that thou art come. Now therefore are we all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. Then he goes on to say in verses 34 and 35, And Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Now watch this. 
worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Over in Psalm 119 and 172, my tongue shall speak of thy word for all of thy commandments are righteousness. So once again, words. God's right. commandments there. Right. His righteous commandments. Then over in uh, verse 42, and he commanded us to preach unto the people. Yeah. So it's going to be words according to Acts eleven fourteen, whereby Cornelius and his household would be saved. Right. Tim, you read a verse which I think is a key verse. Verse 33 of Acts 10. Immediately therefore I sent to thee, and thou hast well done that thou art come. Now watch the attitude. Now therefore are we all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. To do what? To do what is commanded of God. To hear. Yeah. Yeah. Now watch this. The question I want to pose, what kind of audience are you? Now look what a great audience this man is and the people with him. We're here to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. Peter, you speak, we'll do it. On the day of Pentecost, look at the audience. About 3,000 of them were pricked in their heart. These people obeyed. Look at the eunuch. See, there's water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Right. Yeah, and he said, well, if thou believest with all thine heart thou mayest. He said, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Upon that confession, he was baptized. Now, in Acts 7, those people were pricked in their heart. The wrong way. Yeah, they got a different result. Didn't they, they got a different result, and they killed Stephen. Now, what this amounts to, folks, when I hear what God's plan of salvation is, how am I going to respond to it? Well, now, that's not what mom and dad believed. Well, I'm sorry. Is it what the Bible says? One lady says, I'm going to be a Methodist until I'm convinced otherwise, and I'm not going to be convinced otherwise. See, you can help some people. Right. So we got to have the attitude, Lord, speak. Thy servant will obey. You, you show me what the plan of salvation is, the way you want me to live, the way you want me to worship, the church you want me to be a member of, and I'll do it. That's exactly right. And that's what attitude all of us have to have. Howard? You know, I, I took my oldest son today to get his driver's license. And every person that came into that building went through the exact same process. We got a number. We got two pieces of paper we had to fill out. And unless you've done that, I promise you, you wouldn't get your driver's license. If we don't do what God says, we'll be lost eternally. And not one person in there argued. I'm sure they wasn't happy. I, I had to plan this for two months to even get in. I thought there's got to be a better way. I was sitting there thinking today while I was sitting there waiting through this process, there's got to be a better way to do this. But that is the way they organized for you to get your license. And if you didn't do it, you wouldn't get them. Yeah. And God organized a plan for us to be saved, and that's what we have to follow. And Howard, Logan would not have gotten his driver's license if he did not know the driver's manual and answered the questions correctly. If we're going to go to heaven, we're going to have to know the manual. That's right. He failed it the first time. Had to study it again to get it yeah. right the second. Well, I'm shocked that Logan failed as brilliant as that young man is. <laughs> but nevertheless, you just think about that. He had to know that manual in order to get his driver's license. Like you say, he failed the first time. That's better than Eddie going back five times. <laughs> but nevertheless, he, he passed because he knew the manual and... And therefore, he could take his driver's test and get his driver's license. Now, judgment day, according to the Bible, I'm going to be judged according to the word of God, according to John 12, 48. Now, if I'm going to be judged according to the word of God, I better obey the plan of salvation that's in the word of God. I better be a member of the church that's in the word of God. I better worship the way the word of God states. I better endorse the moral code of the word of God, the organization of the word of God, or I'm going to be in trouble. That's right. And you know, Wesley, uh, we want to pass on to something else here in just a minute, but I want to take the time. If there is a difference between the Jew and the Gentile, then it ought to be emphasized in the Bible as far as different plans of salvation. Right. Listen to Acts 15, 7. Peter is talking to the Jews, and he says, when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God made choice among us, now watch, that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear, hear the word of the gospel and believe. Now, verses 10 and 11, same chapter. Now, therefore, why tempt ye God 
and put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we are able to bear. Verse, now notice carefully. But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. We'll be saved even as they, Gentiles, were saved. So the Bible put no distinction between those people. And so we're all saved the same way. Now here comes an interesting uh, question that is oftentimes asked when you're dealing with Cornelius. We learn from the teachings of Acts 10 and 11, he was not saved by Holy Spirit baptism. Great day, Wesley. How many times on a rise to truth have you and Tim and others been engaged with Cornelius when someone says, oh yeah, he, he was baptized and everything, but that was Holy Spirit baptism. Well, the Bible doesn't teach that, does it? No, and they got a problem by the time you come to Ephesians 4 or 5. The Bible says there's not but one baptism. Right. Now, there's six of them mentioned in the Bible, and you can narrow them down to find out which baptism is binding on mankind today. When you read the Great Commission in uh, Matthew 18 through 20, you find out that that baptism is to last until the end of the world. Right. That's baptism in water in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit for the remission of sins. Now, I know Holy Spirit baptism did not save Cornelius. You know why I know that? He said, send to Joppa for Simon Peter who will come and tell thee what? Words. Words. Whereby thee and thy household shall be saved. Now, if the coming of the Holy Spirit was what saved Cornelius, don't send for Peter Right. You don't need him. Just let the Holy Spirit come down upon Cornelius and his household. He's got it. No. That was for a different purpose as we'll see in a moment. But it was the words that set him free. Jesus said, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John 8, 32. Mm -hmm. So all of this is in harmony. And Wesley, Holy Spirit baptism can't be essential to salvation in Tim and class because that's not a command. Holy Spirit baptism was never given as a command. That's right. And so Holy Spirit baptism, not essential to salvation, it was not a command but a promise to the apostles. Now how in the world, Tim, can you obey a promise? Yeah, you can't obey a promise. And, and, and they have a problem when you go to Acts chapter 2, how they were saved there in Acts chapter 2. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. So the gift of the Holy Ghost come after they had to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins in order to have their sins washed away. Then you get over to Acts chapter 10. And like you said, you have people say, well, they had the Holy Spirit first, so that saved them. Well, if that be the case, then you got a contradiction. That's right. Watch this over in uh, Acts chapter 15 and verse 9. And put no difference between us and them. The us there is the Jews, the them is the Gentiles. Watch this. Purifying their hearts by faith. Wait a minute, Tim. How does faith come? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, according to Romans 10 and verse 17. But if it be the case that Cornelius and his household was saved by Holy Spirit baptism, then God did put a difference between the That's us right. and them. That's true. That's right. That's true. And we know that he did not. Well, let's class think just a few moments then about the coming of the Holy Spirit and, and the role of the Holy Spirit it being oftentimes a sign and let's think about that Vicki if you would read John 1 verse 33 for us and we'll let James read John um, I'm sorry Mark 9 and verse number 1 these are on the screen for our folks that are viewing by way of internet and we'll certainly appreciate the men putting that up for us and Acts 1 8 and Acts 2 4 but we'll let Vicki read John 1 33, and if you'll read Mark 9, 1, and Jay will let you read Acts 1, 8, and uh, who else? Hannah, you want to read Acts 2, 4 then? All right, let's read these. John 1, 33, and I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, and the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending, and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. Okay, and James, if you'll read the next one. All right, James, before you read, I want to make a comment. Okay? Now, what's the purpose of reading John 1.33? To demonstrate that the coming of the Holy Spirit was a sign. What sign? All right. John the Baptist did not know who the Messiah was. Mm -hmm. And the Father said to him, When you see the Holy Spirit descending upon one 
and staying? This is the Messiah, the Savior of the world. So the point of John 1.33 was to demonstrate the coming of the Holy Spirit was a sign to identify the Messiah, the Savior of the world. Right, let's look at the next one, uh, James. Mark 9.1 And he said unto them, Very said unto you, There be some of them that stand here, which shall not taste of death, till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. All right, now this next verse is going to relate to that one, to show exactly, it's not going to come until the power comes. Okay, uh, read that one for us, Jay. Acts 1.8. For ye shall receive the power of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto, unto me, both in Jerusalem, in all of Judea, and in Samaria, to the uttermost power, part of the earth. Okay, and then Hannah, read the last one, and we'll discuss these. And they were filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. Wesley, I, we've looked at this before, but... They're so, these verses are so powerful, you know, and as any verses in the Bible are powerful. They make it very clear here that the Holy Ghost is not going to come upon you till the power has come. That's right. And when the power comes, we're going to know the Holy Ghost has come upon them. Well, in Acts 2, 4, the power came upon them. That's right. The Holy Ghost came, the power came, the kingdom came. And, That's right. you know, when you go back and back, uh, look these verses up, and it amazes me that preachers even, and I've heard you ask this, and we've asked this to different ones. Does John 9, 1 mean what it says? That some of those people were going to be living when the kingdom was going to come with power? Now, the, the kingdom either came with power or there's some old people That's in this right. world. Because the kingdom had to come when the power came, but the power wasn't going to come till the Holy Spirit came. According to these verses, not according to just our opinions, but what these verses say. I got a sermon Entitled, Did Jesus Tell the Truth? Mm -hmm. And here's one of the verses, Mark 9, 1. Did he tell the truth when he said, Some of you, let's just say he's speaking to this audience, some of you will not taste of death until you have seen the kingdom of God come with power. Well, some, some of those people within his lifetime, the lifetime of the first century, would see the kingdom come with power. And like you say, then we need to know how the power is going to come. Well, the Bible makes that plain. The power is going to come when the Holy Spirit comes. Well, when the Holy Spirit comes, the power is here. And when the power comes, the kingdom has been established. And, Ed, we got people saying the kingdom has not yet been established. And Jesus Christ said that people in the first century would see it come with power. Exactly. And so we can know that that happened. Now, the giving of the Holy Spirit to Cornelius then, Wesley, was a sign to the Jews that the Gentiles were to be accepted. Vince... Acts 10, 47, if you would, I'd like for you to read that one for us because I think this really helps us to see the point that this giving of the Holy Spirit was a sign to the Jews that the Gentiles could be accepted into the kingdom. And look at uh, Vince, if you would, Acts 10, 47. Can any man, man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? That's interesting. Can any man forbid water that those or these should not be baptized? Well, why would anybody want to re not baptize them? They're Gentiles. They're dogs. We don't mess with Gentiles. We don't eat with Gentiles. They're dogs. We're not going to mess with them. They're not worthy of the same salvation we got. And Wesley, I believe every Jew would have followed that had it not been for the fact of that Holy Spirit being given to them. That's that right. It was a sign that said they're just as good as we are. That's right. And, you know, of course, Peter's done gone through some difficulties here with the Lord, him saying, you don't call something unclean that I've not called I'll unclean. Try. And don't call anything common. All right, we've got a question that's been sent to us. And the question is, does one have to be circumcised to be a member of the church? Well, if you're talking about physical circumcision, no. If you're talking about the circumcision of the heart, then yes. Colossians 2 says and deals with the circumcision of the heart where God does the operating. And so you see sometimes in dealing with questions and we try to teach our students at the Tri-City School of Preaching, Christian Development, you've got to first of all understand the question. And so if you're talking about physical circumcision, no. Now, 
in Acts 15 and 13 and other places, in the first century, the Jews tried to bind two things upon the Gentiles. Number one, you've got to be circumcised physically. And number two, you've got to be, uh, keep the law of Moses. Those two things. Well, it's impossible to keep the law of Moses and keep New Testament Christianity because they're not compatible. So if you mean did they have to be physically circumcised to be Christians, absolutely not. Matter of fact, Galatians says if you be circumcised or uncircumcised, it profits you nothing but a faith that works by love. Eddie, you're in my Deuteronomy class, and we've discovered from the book of Deuteronomy that the Israelites had to be circumcised of the heart. Exactly. But so must we. Mm -hmm. Look at Romans 2, 28, 29. For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly. Boy, I wish every denominational preacher would read that one. Amen. Neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter, that is the Old Testament, mm -hmm. whose praise is not of men but of God. I've got to be circumcised of the heart. I've got to cut away sin, lust, all ungodly things from my heart and love the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, strength, and mind. And if you don't do that, then you can't be pleasing to God. Tim? That's exactly right. Matter of fact, over in Galatians chapter 2, in uh, verse 3, but neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And that was uh, fleshly circumcision because you had the Judaizing teachers that were teaching you must be circumcised and must keep the law of Moses in order to be saved. Over in Acts 15 and verse 5, but there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. They were teaching, he that believeth and is baptized and is circumcised and keeps the law of Moses shall be saved. Right. But that was a different gospel according to Galatians 1, 6 through 9. They were teaching that which was not right. Circumcision of the flesh? No, not for New Testament Christianity, but circumcision of the heart. Eddie. Well, we appreciate that question. And those of you viewing by internet can send us a question. You can send us a question, tweet a question. We would be glad to deal with it. We want you to be a part of our Bible class here. Now, I want to read Colossians 2. I alluded to it, but verse 11 says, In whom also ye were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. That's Romans 2, 28, 29. And so he says, In the putting off of the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Now listen to verse 12. Buried with him in baptism, wherein we are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God. And so you have an operation of God that is taking place. The old man is cut away. And as Paul would say in Romans 6, you're raised to walk in newness of life. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, any man being Christ, he's a new creation. He's a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Eddie, you alluded to uh, Galatians chapter 5 and verse 2. Mm -hmm. It says, Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, this is fleshly circumcision, right. Christ shall profit you nothing, for I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Now watch this in verse 4. Christ has become of no effect unto you, Whosoever you are justified by law, you are fallen from, from grace. Tim, if that's right, if one goes back into the Old Testament and gets a thing like circumcision, he's a debtor to do, do the whole law. Then if one goes back there to get instrumental music, he's a debtor to do all of it. If he goes back over there to say you can't eat certain meats, he's a debtor to do all of it. Mm -hmm. If he goes back over there trying to justify and have many wives, he's a debtor to do all of it. And the Bible says when he does that, he falls from grace, Galatians 5, 4, even though some in the religious world does not believe what that verse says, it's Holy Spirit given information. That's exactly. All right, any other comments on the circumcision from the class? All right, let's pass on then from that to another point. And by the way, again, uh, those of you viewing our program, if you have a question, feel free to uh, ask that question. And so we dealt with Acts 10, 47. Now we learn from Cornelius that he and his household had uh, to do to be saved. What did they have to do to uh, be saved and become members of the Lord's church? And once we find that out, we found out what we have to do as well in order to be saved. Some of these passages we have noticed and looked at from time to time, but they're still just as crucial 
and important to us uh, in this light as well. Now let's think uh, again at some of the passages that we have here. How do you want to read Acts 15, 7 through 9 again uh, for us, please? And we'll notice that and then Acts 11, 18 and 10, 48 again. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, we know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. All right, that sounds a whole lot like one gospel for both. That's right. <laughs> you know, and you just, it's, you just can't get around uh, what the Bible says about that. In Acts eleven eighteen, it says, When they heard these things, they held their peace. They glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Notice, when they heard these things, and so no uh, doubt then the value again of Acts 10, 48, that he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord, and they prayed with him to tarry certain days. Wesley, none, uh, nothing said about the sinner's prayer, the mourner's bench, That's right. or any of those things. That's right. Michael, put the chart back up there if you would, please, if he can hear me. I want to show you something. Uh, according to uh, 15, Acts 15, 7 through 9, I want you to notice... It says, God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth mm -hmm. should hear the gospel and believe. Notice the preaching and then the believing. Mm -hmm. And then in Acts 11, 18, when they heard these things, there's the preaching and then the repentance unto life. And then in Acts 10, 48, and he commanded them, there's the preaching, and then the being baptized. Now, what was he supposed to do? He was supposed to send a Joppa to get Simon Peter who would come and tell him words. Right. Whereby he and his household could be saved. Here we see the words were preached. He had to believe Cornelius and his household, repent, and be baptized in order to be saved. Uh, over in Acts chapter 10, verse 33, we've alluded to this, to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. Now watch this in verse 48. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. So we can see there that baptism is a command of God. Hold right. it, Tim. Is there any such thing as a non-essential commandment? No, there is no such thing as a non-essential commandment. But we have people in the religious world, Wesley, that say that baptism, it's a command, but it's non-essential. Which is ridiculous. That's exactly right. If they're going to do that to baptism, why not do that to repentance and confession and hearing God's word? And faith. That's right. Yeah, you got to believe God said so, I, but I don't believe it's essential. I believe a person that doesn't believe can be saved. Well, if we started making that argument, they'd think we were nuts. That's right. But then here is an inspired man led by God Almighty to the household of Cornelius commanding these individuals to be baptized and then these denominational preachers have the gall to say yes it was commanded but it's not essential I debated a man on radio gave him a series of questions one of them was one must obey the commandments of God in order to be saved he put false and the reason he put false is because I had another question down there it said baptism is a commandment he put true and if one has to keep the commandments of God in order to be saved, baptism is a commandment, therefore one would have to be baptized. He saw the dilemma. And rather than accepting truth, he said you didn't have to obey God to be saved. Then it was a call-in program, and one of his own members called in and said, if I was not baptized for the remission of sins, then why did you baptize me? Absolutely, and he couldn't answer it. Okay, fellas, we have another question called in. How can I be an example if people will not listen? Well, whether people listen or not, we're going to be an example. We're right. going to be either a good example right. or a bad example. Eddie, yeah. they didn't listen to Jesus. No, that's, that's right. right. That's exactly right. Many of them turned to walk with him. The more they had listened to him at one time. Mm -hmm. But we, we've got to do what's right, and we can be an example whether people listen uh, to us or not. And I'm confident that Peter and others, when they went out and preached, there were a lot of people that didn't listen to them. There's about 3,000 obeyed the gospel on the day of Pentecost. But that's not near as many as the people that did not oh, that's right. obey the gospel. That's right. And so they didn't listen either. But 
But, you know, you got to be a good example. It doesn't make any difference whether it, people listen. Yeah, Eddie, the Bible makes the argument that no man liveth unto himself. Right. In other words, uh, we're not on an island out here by ourselves and people not watching. There's people watching us all the time. And there's a poem out, I'd rather see a sermon than uh, hear one any day. Right. And boy, how true that is. Uh, and that's where we get that old adage, why don't you practice what you preach? Because people are watching. Right. Well, in our Galatians class this week at school. Peter in Galatians 2 got caught up in sin. And the Bible says the other Jews did as well. And then even Barnabas, the son of consolation, That's right. got carried away with their dissimulation. Now here was a bad example, and people followed it. People will follow our examples many times when they're bad. All right, well, our time has caught up with us. I don't know where it goes when you have this much fun, but it gets away. Thank you for joining us on our program. We hope that you'll join us uh, next Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, and we'll be discussing some issues that hopefully will be beneficial to you. Till then, may God bless you is our prayer.